Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. So first of all, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this research and for making this conference possible. So on this slide, I've summarized the current state of our knowledge when it comes to the exact value for the leading coefficient C sub K in the asymptotic formula for movements of the Riemann zeta function. So some, so these have been uh, discussed by John already and Sal and some parts have been discussed by Alexandra. So this is just a review. Uh, an asymptotic formula is known only for the first two uh, positive integers. Uh, but thanks to the discovery of Keating and Smith, we now have a prediction for all complex K with real part bigger than or equal to minus one. And the same exact predictions have been reached through other methods. And in fact, we have these earlier methods by Conrad and Grosch and Conrad and Donek that used number theoretic methods to predict C3 and C4. Uh, Conrad and Donek were, was, was about the same time as Keating and Snaith. And then we have the later methods uh, of the Kohlu, Goldfeld, and Hofstein who used multiple Dirichlet series to predict the value of CK for all positive integers K. And the approach of Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubenstein, and Snaith, who devised a procedure called the recipe that predicts the value of CK for all positive integers K. There's also the more recent Conry Keating heuristic, which is not on this slide, but we'll talk more about it later. So for this talk, I'm going to focus on the recipe. Uh, that, that's the wrong slide. Um, so here's the recipe. Um, so, so we start with a shifted moment of the zeta function. So here, alpha and beta are small complex numbers that we call shifts, okay? So we think of A as having K elements. So this product over alpha of zeta is like zeta to the K on the half, right? And this product of zeta over beta is like zeta to the K, the complex conjugate of zeta to the K on the half line. Okay, so that's a shifted moment. And to, to carry out the recipe, um, you, we replace each zeta function by its approximate functional equation and ignore error terms and then multiply out the product and ignore any term that has an oscillating factor. So these, this includes what we call off diagonal terms. The, the expectation is somehow these terms cancel, but we don't really understand how they, they combine or cancel. So the recipe is a procedure and if you carry it out, then you, you reach this final answer. Okay. Um, so this M here is this shifted moment. And the prediction is this asymptotic formula where on the right-hand side, you have a sum over subsets U and V of, well, U of A and V of V that have the same cardinality. And then you have the same averaging as the moment, okay? And then you have this T over two pi raised to the negatives of the shifts in U and V. So you can think of this as uh, the conductor because later on we'll see uh, examples of this for uh, families of L functions and the conductor is what appears here in the, in the recipe prediction. And then we have this arithmetic factor, which is an infinite sum that does not converge, but we interpret as its analytic continuation. So this tau A here, which we're gonna be seeing a lot, is defined by this equation. So you can think of tau sub A as the, if let's say A has K elements, you can think of tau sub A as the k-fold divisor function 
with ships, with small ships, okay? And then this uh, uh, minus superscript is uh, defined by this equation here. So you're just taking the, the negatives of all the elements in the set. So what's happening here is we're, we're seeing some sort of a uh, swapping between the sets A and B, okay? Uh, so to form these two sets that you see, what we're doing is we're taking away the elements of U away from A, multiplying each of them by negative one, and then transferring them to B. Okay, and, and similarly for B, right? So you, you remove the, the elements of B away from B, and then multiply each one of them by negative one, and then transfer them to A. Okay, so this this swapping that's uh, that's going on between the sets. And so if uh, if U and V have let's say cardinality L, then we call that the term inside here the, the L swap term. Okay. So let's look at an, an, uh, let's look at an uh, example of this. So to, just to see a more explicit uh, uh, how the, the swapping happens more explicitly. So let's look at the fourth moment. So let's take A to have two elements and B to have two elements. So let's call those elements alpha one and alpha two. And for B, let's call them beta one, beta two. So with this A and B, the arithmetic factor that you see here without the swaps. So when, when U and V are empty, you can, you can prove that this arithmetic factor is equal to this ratio of zeta functions. Okay, so you can do that easily using uh, Euler products. So let's denote this by uh, Z of alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. And so with this notation, the conjecture can be written this way. Okay. So this is the more general conjecture. This is the conjecture for uh, for the fourth moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's the fourth moment because you have four zeta functions. And this is the term uh, with corresponding to U and V empty. Okay, so that's a zero swap term. And then here, this is the term that corresponds to U equals the singleton containing alpha one and V equals the singleton containing beta one. So in other words, this is the term that swaps alpha one and beta one. So you can see that they, they, they become negative when you swap them. And similarly, this is a term that swaps alpha one and beta two. So, so you have four terms here that swap one element. So these are called or we call these the, the one swap terms. And this last term here, we call it the, the two swap term because it swaps the, the two element set alpha one, alpha two with the two element set beta one, beta two. Okay, so that's, that's what the recipe prediction looks like for the fourth moment. And you can in fact prove this. Okay, so that's why I put theorem here. Okay, so, um, for higher, for higher moments, of course, you expect there to be three swap terms, four swap terms, and so on. So, so that's the, the swapping. Uh, now, the, the recipe applies to a general family of L functions. And for each prediction for a family, there corresponds an analogous theorem for a group of random matrices. And the, the theorem closely resembles the prediction. So here's the theorem that corresponds to the case of the zeta function. So we let u of n be the group of n by n unitary matrices. And we equip it with Haar measure such that the average over the group is one. Okay. And we look at this average of characters or products of characteristic polynomials of the matrices. So the idea is, as in the work of uh, Keating and Snape, the idea is that this characteristic polynomial models the zeta function on the critical line. Okay, so so you have this and the theorem says that we have this exact formula 
And you can see that it resembles the prediction very closely, right? So you have a sum over U and V, so the same sum you have, uh, U and V have the same cardinality. And then you have uh, uh, something like a conductor, right? That's, that's raised to the negatives of the shifts in U and V. And then you have the same swapping. Okay. So the same swapping that you see here, uh, the, the arithmetic factor in the prediction gets replaced by this uh, Z function here, which is defined this way. Question so far. So now, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the recipe is a procedure that uh, ignores the off diagonal terms, right? So when you, when you apply the recipe, you ignore the diagonal terms, but you don't really know how they, how they cancel or combine. So in order to, to try to understand what happens, um, Connie and Keating quite recently examined Dirichlet polynomial approximations for the moments of zeta. So they look at these averages of Dirichlet polynomials. So this Dirichlet polynomial here is an approximation of the product of zeta over alpha. Okay. Um, and this Dirichlet polynomial here is an approximation for the product of zeta over beta that we saw earlier. And this line here is just, uh, you just apply Perron, right? If you apply Perron, then you can, you can write this as an integral in terms of the, the full product of the zeta functions. Okay. And so you can then use the recipe to predict an asymptotic formula for this average of the Dirichlet polynomials, because you see the, the moment, the shifted moment of the zeta function here. So this T integral is the shifted moment of the zeta function. The only difference from, from what we saw earlier is that we, we add the Perron variable Z to the shifts. And we also add the W to the shifts beta. So we add Z to alpha, and we add W to beta. And so you can, you can directly plug in the recipe prediction to this, uh, to this T integral and you get this uh, third line here. So you get this, uh, this prediction for this average of uh, the great polynomials. Uh, this subscript here just means that you're adding Z to every element in the set, okay? And so, so you have this prediction and now the question is, uh, can you prove it? At least for, for certain ranges of X. So the idea is that even though the, the full recipe prediction gives you all the terms, maybe for some values of X, uh, uh, not all the terms from the recipe will contribute to the main term. And in fact, one of the early predictions of Connie and Keating in their study is that the L swap terms, at least intuitively, the L swap terms contribute to the main term only if X is bigger than T to the L. So to see why this is happening, suppose that U and V have uh, both have L elements, okay? So then you have this factor here, X is Z plus W. And if U and V have L elements, then you're, you're subtracting Z here, L times. And you're also subtracting W, L times. So then you have a factor of X over T to the L quantity to the Z plus W, okay? And so the idea is that if X is bigger than T to the L, then you can move the, the Z line and the W line to the left and then pick up residues from zero. And we expect those to be the main, uh, we expect those to contribute to the main term. Uh, on the other hand, if, if X is less than T to the L, then the idea is that you can move the, the Z and W lines 
to the right, all the way to, to infinity, and get that the L swap term is negligible because there's no residue. Okay, so for example, uh, more here. So for example, if x is less than t, x is t to the one minus epsilon, then you only expect the zero swap term to contribute to the only term. And you can in fact prove this quite easily. So we, we call we call this strange uh, all strange to the so they're just basically the same thing they have there now. Next, if uh, if x is between t and t squared, then you expect both the zero swap and one swap terms to contribute. This is much harder to prove, but uh, quite recently, Ali Yahamie and Nathan Ng proved that this is the case under the assumption of an asymptotic formula for correlations of divisor sums. Okay. So here's their theorem. So on the, on the left-hand side, we have the average of the Dirichlet polynomials. And then on the right-hand side, we have precisely the, the zero swap and one swap terms from the residue prediction, right? So, so if you remember from, from an earlier slide, the full residue prediction had uh, all the sets U and V with, with the same cardinality. And so you can, uh, you can read their theorem as saying that if you assume the, the expected asymptotic formula for correlations of divisor sums, and X is between T and T squared, then first, the zero and one swap terms from the recipe are correct. And second, if this, the, the two swap terms are higher, are, are there, then they're negligible compared to the zero and one swap terms. Okay. So, so that's your theorem. Um, this, this expected asymptotic formula that's mentioned here is a, is a prediction that results from using the delta method of Duke, Friedlander, and Ivanet. To, to estimate a sum that looks like this. So we call this a correlation of divisor sums. Uh, some authors call this a shift set convolution sum. So you can apply the, the delta method to predict the asymptotic formula and uh, by ignoring error terms. So it's basically a, a residue calculation. So you, you write this as an integral and then move the integrals and then you get the residues and then you ignore the rest of the integral. Uh, this connection between the, the correlations of divisor sums and the one swap terms has been made earlier by Connie and Keating uh, heuristically, and Hamia and Ng make this connection first. So now you can, you can prove a slightly more general theorem than this by putting a twist here. Okay, so. So if you put a twist here, like m, m over m to the it, then you get this. Okay, let's do that again. <laughs> so um, the only difference uh, on the on the right hand side, the only difference is that uh, the condition m equals n earlier uh, becomes replaced by m n equals n n. Okay. Um, so uh, I put in progress here because I'm confident this is correct, but I'm still working out the details. Range of capital M, capital M. I'm sorry. What's the range of capital M and capital M? Ah, yes, that's a good question. So, so I wrote this in a way that assumes that the M and N are fixed. Yeah, but. If you want to be more precise, then uh, the error term here depends on on the on, the, on M and N. Uh, so so to to prove this more general theorem, you also need a more general assumption. 
than 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 this this previous theorem. So you need you also need n and n here. Okay, but you can you can you can predict an asymptotic formula for that in, in exactly the same way by using the delta method. Okay. So now in the in the next few slides, we're we're going to see several theorems that look like this for different families of L functions. And for each of them, you can you can interpret them as saying that the one swap terms for uh, for that family. So the one swap terms from the recipe prediction for that family are correct. Okay, so usually the zero swap terms is, you know, it's trivial to, to show that they're correct. The one swap terms are harder. So first we have the family of uh, primitive directly L functions average over both the character and the conductor. Okay. And Caroline, Turnage, Butterboy, and I proved this theorem. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have this average over the family. So the average over the family is, uh, so you, you average over primitive characters modulo Q, and you also average over the conductor Q. And then this is a Dirichlet polynomial approximation for the product of the L function. So This sum over M, this sum over M here, is a Dirichlet polynomial approximation for. And similarly for the sum over M, it's that you have a, a conjugate of the character. And then on, on the, on the uh, right hand side, we have, well, you have the, the Perron integral, of course, like from earlier. And then you have the same kind of sum as you see from the, from the zeta case, right? So you have a sum over u, subset of a, b subset of b, uh, such that you have the same cardinality. And you only have the zero and one swap terms. And then you have the same averaging over the family. Okay. And then you have the conductor raised to the negatives of the shifts in u and b. And then you have this arithmetic factor. So the, the arithmetic factor appears, uh, it is the same argument, almost the same arithmetic factor that appears for the zeta case, uh, except you, you have this condition that mm is co-prime to q. Okay, so, so Caroline and I proved that if we assume the generalized Lindelof hypothesis and x is between the parameter q and the parameter q squared, then as before, the zero and one swap terms from the recipe prediction are correct, while the two swap terms and higher, if they're there, then they're negligible. And so, the- So, so, is it, so the side of the family is Q squared. Why do you expect the one swap term when this uh, less than two? Sorry, what's your question? So, so the side, the side of the family is Q squared. Q squared. Yes. So, if theta if eta is less than two, it means like x is less than the fam side of the family. So why do you expect the one swap term? Oh, so you're asking about this uh, the, the this bound for for this one? Yeah, it's mean it's a less than two or it's a less than four. Um so I would say that's not from the size of the family itself, but rather from the from the size of the conductor. So the conductor has size q. And that's that's what we have here. So we 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 just needed an extra averaging. Okay, so yeah, so that's a good question. So we we needed an extra averaging because the the main device that we use in in our proof is the asymptotic large sieve, which was developed by Connie Ivanitz and Sandra Rajan, and was explained uh, two days ago by Matt Young in his talk. So now you can, so Caroline and I actually prove a more general theorem than this with a, with a twist. Okay, so, so the version with a twist is, okay, so th these are the twists. And then, 
Uh, the only difference now is on the right hand side, you have the condition MN equals MN, okay, like before. Uh, of course, you also need M and N to be full prime to Q because otherwise the, the term would be zero. Okay. So next we have the family of quadratic Dirichlet functions and Brian Conry and Brad Rogers have proven this theorem. So on the, on the, left, on the left hand side, you have this average of the family. So it's a sum over uh, square free, odd square free integers. And this is the Dirichlet polynomial approximation for the product of, of L function. So just like, you know, just like, except, except your character is this chronicler symbol, uh, AP over N. And in some stuff, we use the notation uh, I, I, so it's the, the quadratic character with conductor AT. Okay. And then on the, on the right-hand side, you have the Peron integral, and then you have a, a sum over sets, subsets of A. So the full recipe prediction uh, doesn't have this condition. So here you have only the zero and one swap terms. And then you have the same averaging over the family. And then you have this conductor raised in the negatives of the shifts in the, in the set. And then you have this arithmetic factor. Okay, so it's a sum over squares. And the swapping that happens here is, so if you remember for the zeta case, you're swapping between two sets. So here the swapping is between A and, and itself. So the swapping is, you're, you're taking away elements of U away from A, replacing them by their, their negatives and then, yeah, so you, you, you're taking elements and then replacing them by the negatives. So that's the swapping that happens. And uh, the main device that they used to, to, to prove this is the, the technique developed by, by sound that uses the Poisson summation formula to transform smoothed sums of these characters into sums of Gauss type sums. Can probably guess what the next slide will look like. Uh, so again, they they, uh, they actually prove a twisted version of this. So that's a twisted version. So this is your twist. Okay. So it's a twist by the character, and then the uh, the right hand uh, the the only difference on the right hand side is you have this uh, uh, condition. So that the n equals square becomes this n n equals a square. And of course, you need to assume that n is co-prime to, to, to 8p. So, because otherwise the, the entire term is zero. Okay. So next we have the family of L functions associated with Heke eigenkast forms. And Brian Tony and Alessandro Fatsari have proven this here. here. Okay. So here we're averaging over uh, Heke eigen class forms of weight k and level one. And this uh, omega f is the, the natural weight that, that appears in the, the Peterson trace formula. Right? So it's, it's, it's an expression involving the, the Peterson norm. And this is the Dirichlet polynomial approximation for the product of L functions. So, so to be clear, I'm going to write here. The product of that approximation is also where. Uh, so, so the lambda f of n uh, denotes the nth uh, Hecke eigenvalue of n. So these are the, the Dirichlet series coefficients for the L function. And on the right-hand side, so again, as usual, you have the Perron integral, and then you have a, a sum over subsets of A. So the swapping that happens here is, is the same sort of swapping that you see in the, in the quadratic L functions case. So you have, again, the averaging over the family, and then you have the conductor 
uh, to the minus, uh, to the negatives of the, the elements of the cell. Okay, so this arithmetic factor that we see here is defined by this equation where the use here are the, uh, the Shebyshev polynomials and we integrate them with respect to the satellite measure. So two over pi times sine squared theta. Okay, so that's the, uh, uh, oh, and the condition is of course, so you assume the generalized Lindelof hypothesis and X, uh, you assume that X is between K squared and K to the four. So your conductor here is like K squared. Okay, and again, they prove, they actually prove the, the twisted version, all right? So it's, it's slightly more general. So this is your twist, okay? So it's lambda f of m. And the only difference is that uh, on the, on the right-hand side, now the arithmetic factor has this uh, additional uh, factor that you see uh, multiplied here, which depends on the, the, the parameter m. So before we move forward, um, let me describe uh, another way to, to interpret these theorems. So here you, you can see the average over the family and you also see the average over the family here, right? So that means you can say that on average, what you see here, so this, the twist times the, the nuclear polynomial approximation is on average equal to what you see on the right-hand side minus the, uh, the average, okay? So in other words, you have an average, the same average on, the, on, on both sides. So therefore the, the terms are equal on average, okay? So that, that perspective will be helpful for us uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, Sorry, I yeah. have a question. Okay. Yeah, I just want to ask, so you've mentioned the, the, the main tools in the previous theorems. Uh, can you roughly describe what's the main tool? Oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. So, so the, the main tool here is the, the Peterson trace one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, what I hear is no one saying the zero multiple. Right, uh, right, that's a good question. So that's because the, the more precise version of this has the, the functional equation factors here. And so if, you know, if K is, is congruent to two module four, then, then you, you have a sign, like a negative sign or so. Perhaps this is the next slide, but does this mean that you can then using uh, uh, more exciting trace formula do this for mass forms just as well? That's a good question. Uh, we haven't worked on that, but yeah, that's, Keep that in mind for the problem session. Sure. <laughs> Any questions? I guess in terms of motivation is, would you say that the purpose of these theorems uh, is to give some sort of confirmation of the- That's what? The predictions of the recipe? Yeah. The second one, so. Good question. So, Yes, so, yeah, so, okay, so, so we have these theorems that show that the one swap terms are correct. Okay, so you can, you can think of them as making progress towards the recipe, because you show that the one swap terms are correct for the general moment, you know, the arbitrary two case moment. Um, so now the, the next question is, what about the higher swap terms, right? So the two swap terms and so on. Um, so the short answer is we don't know. But we think we have a way to patch together these one swap terms to get the higher swap terms. And that is the subject of the Conrad-Keating heuristic. Inspired by ideas of Bogomoni and Keating, Conrad and Keating have developed a heuristic that shows how we might be able to split moments of data into sort of lower twisted moments to get the L swap terms for general L. And in ongoing work, Brian Conley and I refine the heuristic and 
adapted to other families of L functions. So here's the, uh, the starting observation for their heuristic. If we partition A into a union of this joint non-empty sets, let's say there's L of them, and do the same for B, then you can write this uh, divisor function as a, as a convolution of lower divisor functions. And you know, similarly for, for me. So then if you start with this average of Dirichlet polynomials and then apply Perron, so this just so this second line just Perron. And then, then you can you can write tau A here and tau B as uh, Dirichlet convolutions and, and get this third line. Okay. So that so this this entire calculation is just Perron and then writing tau A and tau B as Dirichlet convolutions according to the, the partitioning of A and B. Okay. So now what we do in the, the conic seeking heuristic is instead of using this, we're going to introduce some twisting and replace each factor here by, uh, by its average with respect to only the one swap terms. Okay. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna make up some notation for that. Um, so this is the uh, this is the the expression from the previous slide. I just rewrote it. So that's just Perron and using the convolutions. So instead of this, we we look at uh, this quantity, which I'm gonna call S sub L. Okay, so that's S sub L, and what we're doing here is we're putting some twisting. Okay, so we put an M, MJ over NJ to the IT, where MJ and NJ are parameters. So you put that twisting, and then you, you replace the, the, that factor after you put the twist, you replace that factor by its average with respect to only the one software. Right? So this is what the, this is the, the perspective that I described earlier. You have the, the same averaging in the, in the theorems, you just take the, the, the one swap terms from the right hand side without the average over the family. So you do that and then you sum over the parameters here. So we sum over the parameters uh, according to these conditions here. You have M1, the product of M1 up to ML is equal to the product of N1 to NL and MJ and NJ are relatively prime. Okay, so, so we, we expect that this, the, these, these sums S sub L form some kind of stratification of the, of the of this average of the clay polynomials, like we're, so you're splitting them into into these uh, into these. So you 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 expect that you can write this sum as a sum of these, although we don't know how to prove that. So that's the notation. I'm going to use this several times. Uh, what it actually looks like is is this. So. So this is the, so this inside the braces, that is the, the average with respect to the one swap terms. So this is what we saw in the, the, the theorem earlier. Okay. So just remove the, the averaging over the family and remove the, the Perron integral. So that's what you get. And the next step would be to, to write the sum over U and V here. Okay, so that sum over U, U and V write it as a, as a multiple contour integral over small circles. Okay, so you can, you can write this as a, as, a, as a multiple contour integral. And then you can bring out those integrals and then evaluate the sum over the MJs and the MJs. So to evaluate the sum over the MJs and the MJs, you use this unitary identity which is rigorous, so you can prove this, okay. at least for, for certain S. Uh, so this is, this is a simplified version of the actual identity we use. Because if you, if you write this as a residue sum, you need a generalization of the tau function here, which, uh, which I'm not displaying on this slide. But that's the idea. So you evaluate the sum over the MJs and the NJs using this unitary identity. And this leads to a, what we call a van der Waals integral. Uh, expression, which is this. Okay. So you have this, uh, these are the Perron integrals. You have the averaging over the family. 
And then these are the, the contour integrals from the one swap terms. So I use Z sub J to, to denote the variables of integration. And then the, this is the, 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 the conductor from the, from the one swap terms. And then you have this expression with the data functions, so it's a ratio of data functions and an absolutely convergent Euler product that has an explicit definition. So you can, you can write out the, the definition of this. Okay, so this is what you get when you, when you apply the, the unitary identity. Okay. And then you can, you can use the residue theorem to, to evaluate the, the, Z, the Z and W integrals. Okay, so the residues will, will come from, from these factors. So that's why that's why you can see the, the, the L the L swap term because you know there's 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 L of these ZJs, right? So so the residues will come as uh, sets of U, of A and B that have L elements. Okay. So in the in the summer of 2019, uh, Brian discovered this formula after some rough calculations. And he asked Brad Rogers if he has seen anything that looks like it. And to that, Brad responded that he and Sound have proven a formula for moments of characteristic polynomials of random matrices that looks very similar to this. And this is their formula. So here again, we let U of N denote the group of N by N unitary matrices. And we take this moment. So this, we have seen this earlier. And so we have a product of characteristic polynomials. So Brad and Sound show that you can write the L swap term from the theorem of CFKRS for this uh, moment in this way. So you can see the, the, the resemblance, right? So it's you to, to go from here to here, all you need to do is replace the zeta functions by this Z function. Okay. Well, that's not all you need to do. I mean, there's, there's others here, but basically the, the, the essential part, which is the, the zeta function part, uh, that looks exactly uh, as what we see here. Okay. And of course, you don't have the Euler product. Okay. So now Brian and I have extended uh, the Conry keeping heuristic to other families. And for each family, we also prove a corresponding theorem for characteristic polynomials of random matrices. So here's for the family of primitive Dirichlet L functions. Here's how the heuristic goes. So we let S sub L be this quantity here. So you have the Perron integral, you have this average over the family, and then you have the, the parameters and the twisting. Okay, so, so if you don't have these, uh, if you don't have this angle notation, which, which just means that you're replacing it by the one swap terms. If you don't have that, and you, if you don't have the, the twisting, and if you don't have this, then the expression that you have here is, is exactly the, the Dirichlet polynomial, the, the average of Dirichlet polynomials, written using Perron and uh, Dirichlet convolutions. Okay, so it's the same as for zeta. So what you do is, you 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 introduce some twisting. So this is your twisting for this family, and you you sum over the, the parameters and you, you replace the, the expression inside the uh, brackets here. So this is the, this is the sum and from the twisted moment. Okay, so you replace the sum and from the twisted moment by its average with respect to only the one swap terms. And the process is exactly the same as for, for zeta because the, the recipe uh, or the, yeah, so the recipe prediction or the theorem for the one swap terms uh, it looks almost the same as, as for zeta. Like the only difference is that you have this condition here that, that uh, 
the the M and N have to be co-parentity. Okay, so you use the same unitary identity, and then you get this van der Moen integral prediction for this SL. So, you, so again, you have the Peron integral, you have the, the averaging over the family, and then you have the contour integrals that come from the one swap terms. You have this conductor, and then you have the same zeta functions that, that we saw from zeta. So these are exactly the same as for zeta. And here you have an absolutely convergent Euler product that is almost the same as for zeta, except you have this co-primality condition with Q. And again, as before, you can evaluate this using the residue theorem and you get the L-swap terms from the residue prediction. So the, of course, the analog of this is for the unitary group, right? so it's the same as for zeta. So the, the analog of this for, for random matrix theory is the, the theorem of drag and so on. Okay, so next we have the family of quadratic theory functions. So now the, the, the twisting is done by putting this uh, character here. Okay. So like before, if you don't have this sum over the parameters mj, and if you don't have this twisting, and you don't have this brackets, then this expression is, is simply the, the Dirichlet polynomial approximation for the moment, written using Perron and, and Dirichlet convolutions. Okay, so we put this twist, and now the way we sum over the parameters is, is this way. So we sum over odd square-free parameters, such that they're, they're product is a square. And to evaluate the sum over the parameters, we use this symplectic identity, which again is a rigorous identity that you can prove. Okay, so, so what you see here, so this is the arithmetic factor from, from the recipe for the, the twisted moment. And on the, on the right-hand side, this is the arithmetic factor for the untwisted moment. Okay, so that's, that's how we're able to pass, patch together the twisted moments to get the, the, the higher uh, untwisted moment. Okay, and so again, you, you, you write this, you, you write the, the average of the one swap or the, the average with respect to the one swap terms as a, as a multiple contour integral. And you get this random one integral prediction for this family. So you have the Perron, uh, you have the average over the family, and then, then you have the, these Z integrals, then you have the conductor, and now your zeta functions look like this. Okay, so that's, that's for the symplectic case. Okay, and, and then you have the Sawyer product uh, that's absolutely convergent and depends on, on B. And then as before, you know, you, you use the, the residue theorem to evaluate the Z integrals and you can get exactly the l term from the, from the rest of the prediction. Now, using this, uh, Brian and I uh, were able to, so guided by this, uh, this expression, Brian and I were able to formulate a theorem for, for the symplectic group and, you know, and prove it. So, so this is the, the analog for, for the symplectic family. So here we let USP of 2N denotes the group of 2N by 2N symplectic unitary matrices. And again, we put it with a hard measure. And here's the average of the characteristic polynomials. Okay, so the average over the group. And this is the, the model for the, for the L functions. And Brian and I proved that uh, you can write the the theorem of CFKRS is so, so that you can write the L swap term from, from the theorem in this way. So this is a, a, a an analog of what you saw earlier here. So you, you simply replace the, the zeta functions here by this Z function. Okay. So next we have the family of L functions associated with Hecke eigenvalues. 
So now this is our S sub F, okay? So again, if you don't have this sum over the parameters, if you don't have the twisting and if you don't have the, the brackets, then that's just the, the average of the Jacobi polynomial. Okay. So we said this is for Ron and, and, and well, now, well, well, now you don't have a convolution, but it's, it's essentially the same. You, you, you split the set A into, into uh, L of these joint okay. So here, what we do is we introduce some twisting. So that's your twisting, down there. And then you, you take the average with respect to the one swap terms. So that's, that's this angle bracket. And then the way you sum over the parameters is this way. So you sum over all of the positive integers with this weight here, where this G function is what we saw earlier from, from, the, from the arithmetic factor. So it's this, it's this product of the, the integral involved in the Chevy shaft polynomial. Okay, so that's your G. That's how you sum over the parameters. And the, the essential identity that we use here is, is this, which again, you can prove rigorously. So this is, this is the arithmetic factor that appears in the twisted moment. This is the arithmetic factor for the untwisted moment. And uh, if, you, if you sum these, these products with these weights, then you, you get that. So, so just, just to remind you what the arithmetic factor is, this is the definition. And then, of course, we get a Vandermond integral uh, prediction. So, this is the Vandermond integral prediction. Uh, so, that's your Perron integral. This is your average over the family. This is, uh, these are the, the contour integrals from the one swap terms. That's your conductor. And then, this is your, your product of or ratio of zeta functions. So it's almost, it, all, it almost looks like the symplectic case, except with, a, with a, some few differences. And again, this is your, your Euler product that's uh, absolutely convergent. And then using this, you can use this other guy to, uh, to prove a theorem for the special orthogonal group of random cases. Okay, so we let S of 2n denote the group of 2n by 2n orthogonal matrices with determinant positive one. And this is the model for, uh, for the family of L functions. Okay, so you're averaging over the, the, the group and this is your characteristic product of characteristic polynomials. And Brian and I proved that um, you can write the L swap term from the CFKRS term in this way. So it, it, it looks almost the same as the symplectic case. The only difference is that uh, in the symplectic case, there was a, a product here with a, with a Z of two alpha. So that's not here anymore. And then the, the sign here changes. For the symplectic case, it's plus and minus. Otherwise, they're all the same. So now I just want to mention that um, all these theorems and these predictions can be generalized to ratios of L functions and uh, the and ratios of characteristic numbers. And if uh, and those can give information about per correlation and n correlation of groups. And that is uh, currently what we are working on. And I also want to mention that in an AIM workshop in 2016, Trevor Woolley suggested that the Connery Keating heuristic has an interpretation in terms of the counting of rational points in algebraic varieties that is the subject of Manning's arithmetic stratification conjecture. So the idea is that when we split the higher moments, of zeta to lower twisted moments. That's like counting rational points on higher dimensional varieties by stratification and, and counting points on, on the, the sub varieties. 
And I think this, this is an interesting idea to explore now that we have uh, the, the extensions of the quantification heuristic to families of L functions. Now I'll end my talk by posing two related open problems. So the first is to find a random matrix to the analog of the quantity keeping heuristic. And of course, as always in, the, in this uh, beautiful relationship between number theory and random matrix theory, you can prove uh, the analogs in the, in the random matrix setting. So you want a, a theorem for, the, for that analog. And related to this uh, first open problem is, what is the correct analog of twisted moments? So that's because the, the Connie Keating heuristic uses uh, twisted moments to form the, the higher moments. So before you can, you can solve this, you need to figure out what's the correct analog of twisted moments. Thank you for this talk. Are there any questions? What is the context of um, Rogers and Sound's random matrix theory identity? So I think they, they, they worked on this in the context of gamma KC. I think Brad was trying to find an expression for gamma KC uh, as, as an integral. And this, this somehow involves uh, finding these random one expressions, uh, right? Yeah, so it, the expression there is a slight oversimplification of what we can show on. So in the, in the paper on DK, in arithmetic regressions, we've written down the first two pieces of this for gamma KC. So that in the paper, and we've written down the other pieces as well, but those weren't published. That's what we should find. So at the end, you mentioned the stratification conjecture. Uh, is this known in some cases? In some, in some cases, like uh, I don't think so. No, it's it's, it's, a, it's a new idea, and we're still exploring. I love so why scientific when I get you associated. Why scientific when I get you associated? Ah, okay. So, so the question is, what specific variety do we, do we look at? So, so the idea is for. So, I think you're writing a, you're, you're splitting the, the device function as a, a convolution. So, yeah. Sorry, And uh, when, when you're evaluating moments of zeta, it's, it's the difference that, that is important. As we've seen from, from the development of information uh, So if you, if you wanna, wanna it's essentially you're solving this equation weighted by device functions. So, so it's like counting solutions of this uh, equation over some ratio H weighted by device functions. And in, in the in the original uh, in the original form of the quantity heuristic, what they do is they, they split they split the, the, the moment into lower twisted moments that have these uh, the twist parameters. So uh, so, so the idea in the, the original form of the quantitative heuristic is that we're, we're counting the solutions of this original problem by, by counting solutions of so the larger. Perhaps a 
analog, which I think cats will explain to us in a minute. Oh. Is when you try to compute moments of close to month sums, you take high powers. This was done by Salier. And you end up trying to count points on varieties in high dimensions. This kind of stratification becomes very complicated. On the other hand, if you use monogram, you get around it directly, and it's sort of some similarity that very hard to count this way. So once you do it this way, but if you look at it from a different point of view, and the counting becomes clear, and that's exactly what's done in Katz's book. Most of my sums that take a few moments to make the same work. That's in this picture. Or maybe not. Can you say something about monogram versus moments? Well, I mean, in, in the function field case, monogramy dispenses you. From having to do these high dimensional point fields. I mean, you can take a moment problem and um, expand it by the definition, and you get some, if it's a, even if you start with, so to speak, a one variable sum, if you try and take a cake moment, um, then naively you have. Now, uh, the k dimensional count. Uh, in general, that's something you don't have any decent way of doing directly. It's just a bigger and bigger mess. But um, how it's going to help here is less clear. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll meet back here at four for our problem session. But before we go out for tea, let's thank Steve one more time for a nice.